This has been the refrigerant of choice and the refrigerant used for many, many years. And it's an HCFC, hydrochlorofluorocarbon, HCFC 22. And because it's an HCFC, we still have the two Cs. So one of those Cs is gonna be the chlorine molecule. And that chlorine molecule is what destroys the ozone layer. However, the difference is because they added the H, the hydro molecule, that H in there kept this refrigerant a lot more stable. So the sun didn't break it down nearly as quick. So it didn't destroy the ozone layer as fast. In 1987, 137 countries came together to sign the Montreal Protocol. And the first thing they wanted to do is get rid of the old R12 refrigerants. And eventually they said, we're gonna be getting rid of the HCFC R22 refrigerants. And that was gonna be in the year 2020. Well, the year 2020 has now come and gone. So they can no longer make this refrigerant new. So we can only use this refrigerant that's left over. In other words, anytime we take a system that's being decommissioned, we take that refrigerant out, we put it into recovery tank, we send that tank off and they can take and reclaim and make that refrigerant new and resell it in these same containers. So this refrigerant is still available. You can still buy this refrigerant, except because they're not making it anymore, the price has shot up. And the idea was that they would force the price to go up to force people to buy a cheaper, newer refrigerant. But this refrigerant being an HCFC, hydrochlorofluorocarbon, was a lot more stable, so it bought them more time. But still, everybody in the industry pretty well waited until the very last moment before they switched over because they loved this refrigerant so much. What was great about this refrigerant was a few things. One, it was a single molecule refrigerant, which means I could charge it as a vapor like it is now, the connections over here at the top, or I could turn it upside down and charge it as a liquid, slowly throttling it in through the suction side. I could charge it either way as a single compound. But the best thing about this refrigerant was the fact that it used mineral and alkabenzylene oil. The oil was the key to this refrigerant being so great and so easy to work with. This alkabenzylene and mineral oils did not absorb moisture very well at all. So people didn't pull a vacuum very well, they cut corners, and they would get away with it. It was still a problem, still reduced the life of the system, but it didn't immediately turn to an acid. On top of that, they wouldn't run nitrogen while they brazed. Now on the commercial side, they would still run nitrogen while they brazed. But the key is this oil left the oxidation inside of those copper pipes. It didn't strip it off. Now, yeah, it was still a good practice to braze with nitrogen, but not that many people did. So there was a lot of corners you could get away with. So this oil was key for this refrigerant success. This refrigerant has an ozone depleting potential an ODP. So because it's ozone depleting, we knew it was gonna go away, 2020 is coming gone, and this refrigerant has now been retired. It's no longer being made new, but it's still available, it's still active. And they replaced this HCFC refrigerant with this HFC refrigerant, which is a hydrofluorocarbon. Notice there's only one C in there, hydrofluorocarbon. There is no chlorine molecule. So this refrigerant is non-ozone depleting. So hey, we no longer put a hole in the ozone layer, the stratosphere several miles up, the three molecules of oxygen, the ozone is safe. And the ozone was good up high, bad nearby. We didn't want smog. That, moving over to this, saved the ozone layer. But they did find out that this refrigerant has a climate change potential. In the US, we call this a GWP for a global warming potential. The potential in there says it has the potential to do this. Not saying this definitely does cause climate change, it has a high potential of doing that, of several thousand times higher than what CO2 would be. So this refrigerant does not destroy the ozone, yay! But it does have a potential for causing global warming. So now, just recently, they've decided they're going to stop making this refrigerant and switch yet to something else. So the key is, a lot of people get this mixed up, this is an ozone depletion refrigerant refrigerant, although it has a low global warming potential, this one is non-ozone depleting, but it has a high global warming potential. That's the difference between these refrigerants, but the big difference in this refrigerant is going to be the oil. This refrigerant uses polyester oil, a PoE oil, and that PoE oil used to be an acid. So they took this acid, they took the moisture out of this acid and turned it into an oil. And they thought this would be a great idea, and I'm not a scientist, I don't know why, but they decided it was gonna be a good one. And that oil was key because this refrigerant will not carry the alkabenzylene and mineral oil. So if we just simply switch the refrigerant, the oil wouldn't circulate through and it starts eventually burning up compressors. And you're gonna hear people say, oh, I modify it all the time and I've never had a compressor fail. 
I had a guy that I worked with that refused to change his oil and he would sell his car every 50,000 miles and he swore that he never had an issue with it and oil changes were a conspiracy. I don't know. I just know that if I didn't go that long without changing the oil, I would be the guy replacing the engine. So I know that this refrigerant doesn't move that oil around. Can the engine last without oil? I, I don't know. I'm not willing to take that risk for my customer. This refrigerant uses the polyester oil. Now that oil is the difference. People hate this refrigerant, but really they shouldn't hate the refrigerant because it's a good refrigerant. It's the oil that's the evil guy on this one. So that polyester oil used to be an acid and a dehydrated acid and for whatever scientific reasons it made an oil. And the oil had the right viscosity and also it flowed with this refrigerant. The problem with that oil is it's very sensitive. So if it gets moisture again, it turns back into an acid. So if we don't pull a good vacuum, guess what? Yeah, it turns to an acid. That acid starts eating away through the whole system. It eats the windings in the compressor, eats holes in the evaporator coil, eats holes in the condensing coil. That's a bad thing. So the oil in it turns to an acid. We don't want that to happen. So having a critically, critically clean and dry system was important. The second thing is this polyester oil that this refrigerant uses is also a cleaner. It's a great cleaner. So when we have the oxidation left from not running nitrogen while we brazed, that oxidation on the pipes was cleaned off by this refrigerant, which sounds great, except we've cleaned it off of all the piping and now it's flowing through the entire system. Getting hung up in the compressor, getting hung up in our filter dryers, and getting hung up in our metering devices and the screen in front of those metering devices. So that oxidation is now an issue. So people would say, well, I never had the braze while purging nitrogen before, a uh, different refrigerant and a different oil. So you were supposed to do it then, we got away with it, and we all had bad habits, but now we have the new oil and it causes big issues. Well, where does most of the time that oxidation end up clogging up? It clogs up the metering device, and the TXVs are great metering devices, but now we have all these TXVs being clogged up and people say, oh, TXV is bad because they fail. Most likely it's being failed because of the oil and not running nitrogen through while we braze and that's the bigger issue. So the catch is now that this refrigerant is going to be going away because of the high global warming potential, GWP, there's going to be something else replacing this. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but these are right now your two most common refrigerants you see. This one's really dated. It's, it's pretty well gone. And this was going to be the replacement refrigerant for it, but now this one's going to be replaced by something else. And it's interesting that this one is still in the market while this one is already being phased out. Now, why I say this is the replacement refrigerant, I need to make something very, very clear. Just because this refrigerant is going to be replacing it, it replaces it with replacing the entire system. You don't just take this refrigerant out and put this refrigerant in. This refrigerant is entirely different. It has a different weight to it. It weighs different than the refrigerant. It absorbs a different amount of B2s per pound as it changes state. So because this refrigerant has a different weight to it, it absorbs heat different, has different properties to it. So the compressor as it's pumping refrigerant moves a different amount of refrigerant. I'm gonna post a link in the description showing the difference between an R22 compressor and a 410A compressor. And you can see that the compressor side for R22 is gonna be larger. The compressor size for the 410A is actually a smaller compression size. So if I tried putting this refrigerant in an R22 system, we're gonna be messing up our compressor and how that compressor pumps and how much volume of refrigerant that's pumping and we will not have a system designed for that. The other thing is this refrigerant works at a higher pressure. Now the compression ratio on two systems identically designed will be the same compression ratio, but this has a higher pressure. So if the system is designed for brazes that aren't able to handle the higher pressure, there's going to be more and more leaks. So in the system, as we change from R22 to 410A, we have to replace the system for a 410A system and we have to use the Peely polyester oil. Hydrochlorofluorocarbon, HCFC, hydrofluorocarbon, HFC. Ozone depletion, low global warming. Ozone depletion, high global warming potential GWP. But don't worry, we don't have to immediately switch the entire system. If we have a unit that has this refrigerant and we can't afford to get this refrigerant, we don't have to replace this whole system. They make many different styles of refrigerant that we can replace it with. So there's tons of different refrigerants available. So I can take a system that's using this refrigerant and I can put a different refrigerant in there. Now this is called a retrofit. So we're gonna to have to retrofit it from this refrigerant over to some other kind of refrigerant. 
Now, what refrigerant you should use, that's going to be tricky. There is a slew of refrigerants out there. So you have to find out what's really going to work. And they all have a great marketing team saying theirs works better. If we have a system that uses R22, nothing is going to work as good as R22. If we take the R22 out and put in an entirely new refrigerant, it will not work this exact same. Now, there's some that work pretty close. There's some that work pretty good, but it doesn't work exactly the same. So there's different refrigerants now available. So we can take the R22 out of the system and we can put entirely retrofit it to a new refrigerant, putting it back in to get a few more years of life out of it. Now there's tons and tons of different varieties to go with, and I can't tell you which one's going to be the best because I don't know your application. Some of these refrigerants are designed to still work with the mineral oil or the acabenzaline oil. If I'm going to take a system and modify it to get just a few more years of life out of it, I want it to be as easy as possible. So taking the refrigerant out and putting another refrigerant in that works with that same oil is a nice benefit. A lot of the other refrigerants we use, we have to switch over the oil to the polyester oil, the same oil that this refrigerant uses. That's hard. That's very difficult because we're going to have to take the compressor out and then dump the oil out of the compressor and flush it and flush all the oil out of the lines. And that's a pain. Now, different manufacturers say you can leave a different percentage of the acabenzaline or mineral oil in the system and still have it work. You need to check the retrofit instructions to see what refrigerant is going to work. So if I take the R22 out of the system, I need to follow the retrofit guides. And every manufacturer has a retrofit guide. Now, there's another catch in this. There's a lot of manufacturers using words such as drop-in replacement. And by definition, there is no refrigerant that's a drop-in refrigerant. Drop-in would mean if I had a system with R22 in it, and I take this R22 and I can top it off, add more R22 to the system. But drop-in would mean I could mix another refrigerant in there. We are not allowed to mix refrigerants. If I have R22 in here, I can only put R22 in. If I want to retrofit it to something else, I have to take the R22 out and then retrofit to what other refrigerant's going to go in there. You're not allowed to mix those refrigerants. If we do mix refrigerants, we have to then recover it all and send it off to be disposed. Also, once we mix refrigerants, it completely kills. It destroys what our saturation is going to be. So when we take our PSIG, convert it to a saturated temperature, it's not going to follow the temperature and pressure chart. And people say, well, it's the same pressure as R22. No, once you take two different chemicals and you mix them together, it destroys and completely erases what the PT chart was for this refrigerant and this refrigerant. So neither chart is going to work and you have no clue where your saturation's at. And if you have no clue where your saturation's at, you have no clue where your superheat's at, you have no clue where your subcooling's at, you have no clue what the system is really doing. You can just simply make, oh, it's making noise and blowing cold air. That's the best you can do. If you follow the correct retrofit procedures, you're probably going to be just fine. And again, every manufacturer has retrofit procedures. There's always somebody saying, oh yeah, you can just mix them. And every time I've contacted a manufacturer, say, oh yeah, so-and-so said that. And I've contacted a manufacturer and asked, hey, is this true that you can do this? They always say no, follow our retrofit procedures. They print these retrofit procedures for a reason. They call it drop-in so that they can make it sound easy, but there is no such thing as a drop-in. They're all retrofit. So I can retrofit the system that had R22 to work with a different refrigerant. And I'm not promoting any of those refrigerants. There are some that's going to be better in some scenarios than in other. I've used about four different types of refrigerant retrofits. I don't know any that I really like the best because they all have some kind of a flaw. The other option is to replace the entire system that uses hydrofluorocarbon refrigerant or you can simply retrofit it for long enough and wait for whatever the replacement for this refrigerant is going to be and then go with that refrigerant. So there's a lot of variables going on right now. So yes, it's a little bit confusing, but overall, whatever refrigerant you have in the system, convert that to a saturated temperature, use superheat, convert it to a saturated temperature, use subcooling, and you know what's happening with that system.